March 26, 2024 was one of the most infamous days in Baltimore history. A massive container vessel struck the 1.6 mile long Francis Scott Key Bridge, killing six construction workers. And as tragic as the event was, it also caused significant economic backlash and has forced Baltimore to respond swiftly in both the cleanup effort and the design and construction of a new bridge. In one of my most well-produced videos I've made to date, today we're gonna find out exactly what happened and take a look inside the colossal effort to create a brand new mega bridge. The Francis Scott Key Bridge, owned and operated by the Maryland Transportation Authority, was open to traffic in 1977. Sitting in the Baltimore area, it carried Maryland Route 695 over the Patapsco River, connecting Dundalk to Hawkins Point. Spanning around 9,000 feet in length, the bridge was constructed from steel and concrete. It features a continuous steel through truss section over the river with the north and south approaches made of multi-beam plate girder spans. The main span provided a vertical navigation clearance of 185 feet and a horizontal clearance of about 1,100 feet between supporting piers. At the time of the collapse, the key bridge consisted of two northbound and two southbound travel lanes. The annual average traffic for calendar year 2023 was 34,000 vehicles per day, with trucks making up around 10% of this traffic. For protection, when the bridge was constructed, there were four large dolphins put in place. These dolphins were each constructed with a 25-foot diameter pile filled with concrete and capped with reinforced concrete. The dolphins were not only in place to help with impact protection, but were also used for navigational assistance, as you can see in this picture. The first dolphin was in place around 500 feet back of Pier 17, sitting approximately 550 feet off of the center line. The Dali, a large cargo vessel, was powered by a single 55,000 horsepower diesel engine connected directly to a single propeller. To operate, this engine required one of the vessel's four diesel generators to be functional, as the emergency generator alone could not suffice. The engine also required compressed air for starting and reversing, necessitating a shutdown and restart to change directions. Safety features were integrated automatically to shut down the engine if critical supporting systems, like the lubricating oil and cooling water pumps, lost power. Power. The vessel's electrical system comprised four AC generators. These generators supplied power to the 6600 volt high voltage distribution which dispersed power to various systems, one of which was the main engine's lubricating oil pumps. The low voltage distribution which was powered from the high voltage supplied power to lighting and other equipment. At midnight on March 26, eight road maintenance workers were on the key bridge protected by police units directing traffic. Around five minutes after midnight, pilots boarded the Dali, preparing for its departure from Seagirt Marine Terminal to Colombo, Sri Lanka, with about 4,700 containers. The vessel was assisted by two tugboats, which pulled the Dali away from the dock as it entered the Fort McHenry Channel at 1.07 a.m. The senior pilot ordered dead slow ahead and then slowly increased the speed, setting a course of 141 degrees toward the key bridge. At 1.25, approximately 0.6 miles from the bridge, two electrical circuit breakers unexpectedly tripped, causing a blackout that stopped the main engine and the steering pumps, rendering the vessel immobile with a heading of 141.7 degrees and a speed of 9 knots. Despite generators 3 and 4 continuing to run, most bridge equipment lost power. The emergency generator started, powering essential emergency systems in the emergency steering pump, but without propulsion, steering was ineffective. The crew manually restored power to the low voltage distribution, but a second blackout occurred when the vessel was about 0.2 miles from the bridge. Generator 2 then restored power to the high voltage distribution, but propulsion was still not regained. At this point, assistance was called for and the anchor was dropped, but it was far too late. At 1.29 AM, the Dali struck pier number 17 at 6.5 knots, causing six spans of the bridge to collapse onto the vessel. One crew member narrowly escaped injury, while another sustained injuries from falling debris. A road maintenance inspector managed to avoid the collapse, but seven workers in their vehicles fell with the bridge. One worker was rescued by police, but unfortunately six unexpecting people didn't make it. The collapse led to a major disruption, blocking maritime access and affecting nearly 70 ships either destined for or trapped within the port. The only unaffected port was the Trade Point Atlantic Marine Terminal at Sparrows Point, which prepared for a major influx in traffic. Maryland's governor declared a state of emergency, and the Maryland Secretary of Transportation suspended all shipping to and from the entire port of Baltimore. 
The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers led the salvage operation supported by the U.S. Navy in heavy lift cranes, including the Chesapeake 1000, which has the ability to lift around 1,000 tons. The operation included 32 Army Corps of Engineers personnel, 38 Navy contractors, and over 1,100 engineering specialists. A significant fleet, including seven floating cranes, 10 tugboats, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats, were deployed for the cleanup. Engineers began removing debris from the river on March 30th. By April 1st, the Coast Guard had opened a temporary passage for recovery vessels, approving passages on a case-by-case -case basis. Multiple channels were created to facilitate the movement of work vessels with the first such passage used on April 2nd. And on April 7th, salvage crews began removing containers from the Dali. By mid-April, the salvage team had cleared over a thousand tons of steel and removed 120 of 140 containers needed to create a staging area. By April 26, 3,000 tons of debris had been cleared and 171 commercial vessels had used the alternate channels. On May 13th, explosives were used to remove a part of the bridge span resting on Dally's bow. The ship's hull remained intact below the waterline, which was very helpful during the salvage efforts. By May 20th, Dali was freed from the wreckage, pulled from the mud, and moved away from the bridge, which marked a significant milestone. And finally, on June 10th, the channel officially reopened. As mentioned earlier, the collapse also caused significant supply chain disruptions by blocking access to all marine terminals except Sparrows Point. Shipping lines sought alternative ports and arranged land transportation to avoid detention and demerge charges. Four major shipping lines declared force majeure, terminating contracts once cargo reached diversion points. Notably, automakers Stellantis and GM diverted vehicle imports, and Toyota reported potential major impacts to exports. Economists believe the port closure would not significantly affect U.S. economic growth, but one estimate suggested that the initial weekly cost of disruptions could have sat at around $1.7 billion. Insurance losses from the collision were estimated between $1 and $4 billion, potentially the largest marine insurance loss in history. Baltimore's mayor and city council pursued legal action against Grace Ocean, Maersk, and Synergy Marine. Chubb Limited, the bridges insurer, processed a $350 million claim for the state government. This will be the first of many payouts as it relates to the collapse, and there's a good chance that the other amounts will be significantly higher. In a typical construction project, construction drawings are drafted by a design firm and revised multiple times before the final drawings are ready for bid. At this point, one or more contractors would bid on the project based on the drawings provided. However, this project will be totally different. Because authorities want the new bridge to be built expeditiously, contractors will be bidding on a project and submitting their own design ideas for the bridge. Over 1,700 contracting firms participated in a May 7th MDTA briefing for the project. And on May 31st, the MDTA issued a request for proposal, seeking a visually attractive design with minimal piers in the Patapsco River and substantial vessel collision protection. The agency planned to select a design build team by mid to late summer to finalize the project's scope and requirements. Requirements. All of this targeting final completion by fall 2028. Although this is four years away, completing a bridge of this scale in this span of time would be nothing short of impressive. The project will either be fully funded or have a large majority of it funded federally, meaning the region would face much less of a financial burden. This is a major positive for Baltimore as the city and surrounding area has, as mentioned, already lost out on billions of dollars due to the collapse. So now the question is, what will the new bridge look like? The most sensible design would be a cable state bridge. With the MDTA requesting minimal piers and a higher bridge deck, this bridge could look fairly similar to the Gordie Howe Bridge that's currently being built on the Detroit-Windsor border. I've made a separate video covering that bridge in detail, and I've linked it in the description if you want to check it out after this video. Interestingly, the bridge length of the Gordie Howe is right around 1.6 miles, and the key bridge was the same. Cable state bridges are typically stronger in most environments than suspension bridges, and the build process is considerably faster for a length like this one. WeBuild in early May became the first engineering and construction firm to submit their design proposal. The design is cable stayed as expected, but looks a bit more like Florida's Sunshine Skyway Bridge in St. Petersburg. No matter what firm wins the bid for construction, this will be an extremely impressive mega project in response to a tragic accident, and will hopefully enable the area in ways the previous bridge couldn't. The new bridge will undoubtedly garner a lot of attention and make national headlines for every milestone that it crosses. If you're still watching, whether you realize it or not, you're a key supporter of this channel and I want to say thank you. If you want to check out some of my other videos, please do so. Either way, thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.